Hey guys, this is Crap Hunter, and welcome back to Rome Total War 2. Now, this quick video will be a quick heads up for single player campaign. Now, the reason why I'm doing single player is because I've looked at some of the videos on um, GDTV, and a fair amount of them are leaning towards the multiplayer aspect. Now, this isn't a bad thing, because I know there's a fair amount of guys out there who love multiplayer, but I'm thinking about, I thought, why not make a video about the single player people? Because there are a fair amount of people who play the single player campaign just as much as the multiplayer. And there's a few things that you new players out there might not have caught on already if you have if you played the prologue. Now, in the prologue, they do talk to you a lot about what you've got in here. They also talk to you about the technology, stuff like that. But there are certain things which which even though I played the prologue and tutorials, caught me out. Um, this being popularity, and most of it, most of it is more popularity and how to deal with stuff in Rome. And a couple of things also helps in technology, but we'll go on to the technology in a few minutes. First of all, though, let's look about how you can deal with the popularity issue and um, deal with food shortages if you ever should deal with them. So in Rome 2, you've got a new style of settlements. Now, originally, in older Rome games, every settlement was different. Every settlement was in their own province. In, for example, Shogun 2, you had one settlement per province, and the province had its own unique bonus. Well, in this time, they've completely, they've removed that, mostly, and instead grouped settlements into what was known as a province. So, for example, let's go click on Rome. Um, as you can see, all the settlements in this area, Italia, this is the, what the province is called, all of these settlements are combined into one. Uh, and if you, own, if you own all of the settlements, you can select an edict, which allows you to um, increase the... It's kind of a, an ability to help the people. You know, you can either be a greedy bastard and have a tax rate, or you could have a commercial stimulation, which means um, it allows you to add more wealth, or you can have Romanization, which basically means that you have to... You know, you'll be just increasing that. Or, as I've done, you can have bread and games, which basically means all the people can enjoy a nice sense of food. You can enjoy um, having as much, you know, you can enjoy food, enjoy being popular, and hopefully in the time that that's finished, I'll be able to move on and do awesomer things. But, when you are, for example, like myself in my Let's Play, and if you are wondering, this is the Let's Play map that I'm using for my Rome 2 campaign, so if you want to check that out, feel free to check out my channel. Oh God, advertising. <laughs> anyway, um, no, but if you if you are current, if you're in a position where you've recently started as Rome, and these two settlements, which aren't actually under your control when you start the game, these although are not under control, they still are part of your settlement, um, your part of your province, and as such, if you should launch an attack and take the settlement, so say for example, I have a Roman army and I go over there to attack it and I capture it, and you're given the options to either occupy, loot, or raise the city. What this does, in actual fact, also causes um, what you what this does. I mean, obviously, as you can tell, it has a popularity decline. People don't like you for doing what certain things. So, for example, if I chose to loot it, then what would happen was to all of the settlements I control within the province, they would suffer a popularity decline as well as um, this settlement here. And if you're inexperienced in campaign, this can catch you out, as it did me, because all of a sudden, the moment I looted that settlement, they were like minus 55, and then I went back to my Roman settlement, and oh my gosh, so is Rome, oh my gosh, so is Neapolis. And because of that, all the settlements in this province um, most of the settlements in this province were all like booing and hissing and hating my ass just because I was conquering the rest of the world. God. Um, now, I don't know whether that's a glitch or is that how that's how it's being designed for the game. Um, it could be of multiple factors, but at the moment it's something you've got to be aware of because if you're going further into the field and then you start going against regions like there, that might be the capital, there's a province capital and you might take over Pavit you might take um, this settlement and this settlement and they're all fine but then you might go for this settlement you know you might go oh the populace is being really arsy to me I'll raise it to the ground then this settlement and this settlement may rise up in arms against you because you raised that settlement down I personally don't like that feature in the game but I'm imagining um, it has uh, people did it so I'm, I'm imagining there's a reason behind that so it might not be so much so this is something you've got to be aware about, and as such, a good countering system, in this case, is to make sure that each of your settlements has at least has one of these buildings inside them, either a Temple of Mercury or anything with a pink-looking building. 
Um, when you don't have the ability to, when you don't have these in, it will allow you to build like a consecrated ground. And then after we've built the consecrated ground, you can then start to design, uh, put buildings in, and it has like a list of all different temporals that you want to have. So you either want a temple of Mercury. I like temple of Mercury because it allows an extra 10% of all wealth from all buildings, and it also provides a two extra garrison of plebs. Um, or you want to go for a shrine of Minerva, which although provides only one garrison of plebs, it adds to my research rate. It might be that I might get more shrines to Minerva because that means I might be able to research faster, but then I won't be able to earn as much. You know, there's, 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 it's hit and miss. But when you are conquering multiple settlements, or if you are conquering settlements, and make sure that in each of your settlements you have at least one, you have one of, maybe you might be able to have one of these at least. And if you can build it up, you can counteract the negative appeal. Because don't forget, you've still got to manage your taxing. You've also got to manage your amount of food as well. Things like that, I've got to be careful. And now speaking of food, once you also have to make sure that you've got some food stuff to be aware of. So for example over here, um, I haven't got much in the way of food because most of my settlements, I'm going to try and charge up north in this campaign. So I'm making sure this is going to be my money making, my army side of things. But down south where there aren't so many problems about war, um, Brundism, I believe, yeah, it's a fishing colony, so I'll be having six food, and then what I'll be able to do is when I upgrade, I'll be able to buy that. And although I have problems with my public order, I'll be able to have, um, I'll be able to increase my food, in, my food income. Over here as well, I can increase my herding ground to a cattle pen. And there's also this as well, which allows you to have a Roman village, and you can also increase the size of your villages. But here's another interesting fact, this is a separate province. So all the crap that goes from one province here actually doesn't isn't affected over here. As you can see, my populace is really happy here. They don't mind it because I was quite lucky with this. But because I looted and raided stuff over here, the populace isn't is 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 just about to recover. So if you guys are new to the campaign, be aware that that stuff can happen. Okay, so that's about uh, at that on the t on the managing a settlement frontier. Now let's talk about technology, because if they haven't, if they don't talk to you, because in the prologue campaign they don't really talk to you much about what is a good idea. It kind of they kind of leave it up to you. Now let me show you how it works in, in the technology. When you start out with your technology, you have two only two options to research. You either have to click on land management or you want to click out on supply reforms. Now this basically this is just like the introductionary researching of technology. So then after this, you as it says here, research this technology to unlock three military um, technology chains. And in these affect a variety of things in your campaign. For example, the one I've got at the moment is management. So what this basically means is it allows me to create a more either money efficient army because don't forget an army is an expensive as army is an expensive oddity. So this basically means um, I can actually research, you know, as it says here, I can make it cheaper to recruit ships and I make it cheaper to run ships. Over here, I allow it for myself to have cheaper to own, earn, and recruit armies. I also get the ability to recruit or construct um, an auxiliary bar barracks, which, if you want to put in certain aspects, makes it so that pay ordinary people have less of good quality troops, but it might, you know, cause a bit of a might not let cause as much of a stir. I, I, I can't remember much. Then the second one is about military tactics. So basically, these apply to the front line. This basically applies to during the battle. So for example here if I wanted to click on it, it allows me to add 5% to my morale for all training, all um, groups of soldiers, and it also enables me to build a training field. In this, this basically means that my troops are going to be able to perform better in the field than most other people, and that's something you want to be aware about. Finally, you've got the option of siege. Now, before I go on, I'm just going to state that probably different nations have different styles of technology, but all of these apply to the same thing. You're still going to get siege, you're still going to get tactics, and you're still going to get management. So in this one, it basically allows me to have better engineering, which means I can... Um, that basically means I can build a workshop, which means I can prov get armor for my troops, and it also means I can then... That way the enemy can hold out for one less turn. But then on this one, it allows me to but then boiling oil, oil allows me to have an extra turn. Just generally speaking, it helps you out if you're under siege by multiple na a nation or two. There you go. Attrition losses. Ah, another cool thing. You also, lo you also literally lose soldiers in attrition when you're under siege. Keep your eyes peeled about that, because I'll be making sure 
I'll be doing that for certain points. Now let's go over to the civil stuff. Now in the civil stuff, you have pretty much the similar aspects, only uh, you have quite similar aspects in this. First of all, you have your economy. Quite, it, quite simple to understand. Basically, the mo it basically means that you add it adds wealth and percent percentages of wealth to your buildings. Then you have philosophy, which basically means it allows you to earn what wisdom money from culture buildings, and it also, you know, also it allows you to perhaps increase your tax rate, wealth from buildings. Also, um, it might cause you know it might stop you from having so many political incidences, more tax rates, higher tax rates, uh, consensual contracts, more tax rates. They this this seems to be leaning towards our tax rate, but we can't blame it. Then finally, you have construction, which basically allows you to build buildings, um, extra buildings, be able to get gladiator schools, be able to increase the size of your towns, um, making it easier to do that. You can you can go uh, improved plumbing, which means that your people will be able to enjoy s lovely sewers, um, making more stuff like that. And then finally, you can have like the molded architecture, which is then basically makes your town look really impressive and stuff generally like that which if you guys have like plans for making your certain civilization great so don't forget though if you wanna win the game though you can have multiple ways of doing it where is it there you go so I have military economic or cultural so these technologies all cater towards what you wanna have so if you're just determined like I am to basically conquer the world and make sure that nobody gets out of it, then you may focus more in upon the military technologies and less so on the economy. Economy, But don't forget, you also want to make money whilst you're in war, otherwise your armies will grind to a halt. So you might want to stay a bit for a while and research some of these things. And they might provide better benefits than you previously had thought. So hopefully you understood in that monstrosity bar bag of information that just was thrown at your face. Um, a bit about how to run a Roman campaign civilization style because you know stuff like this if you're inexperienced in Rome too these bits can catch you out and completely ruin your campaign and if that's you know and I've had I've done it I've had it before where I haven't quite fully understood everything but hopefully this video might help you out and hopefully avoid making the mistakes like I did when I first tried stuff like this so, thank you very much for watching. If you'd like this kind of content, feel free to let us know by putting in a comment section, um, also clicking on the like button, and subscribing. Um, I also have stuff like this. I have a Rome 2 campaign on my one, so feel free to go check that out if you guys are interested. Thank you very much for watching. This is Crap Hunter, signing off.